My name is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council, and the Graphene Council is hosting today's session, a masterclass on Raman spectroscopy of graphene. For those of you who are not familiar with who the Graphene Council is, we are a global trade and professional body. We connect more than 30,000 materials professionals, both in academia and in the commercial sector. We run a very wide set of services to support the graphene sector and industry, including a verified graphene producer program. We are very active in writing standards uh, for the graphene sector through our involvement in the ISO working groups, including the graphene classification framework, which was authored last year and is going through the standards development process now. For today's session on Raman, we chose this topic because Raman spectroscopy is so widely used when it's uh, involving graphene materials. It's probably the most commonly used methodology to characterize the material. And it's important that it be conducted consistently, correctly, and that the results are in interpreted in, um, in a consistent manner, which is, uh, which is why we're doing this, um, this session today. Um, the last word I want to say before I hand over to our co-host, Charles Clifford from the MPL and Angie Height-Walker from NIST in the U.S., is that when we talk about graphene, especially from the Graphene Council's perspective, as we are heavily focused on commercial application of this, there is an ISO standard definition for graphene, which includes just not the monolayer version of it, the single atomic layer of carbon, but anything up to and including 10 layers of sp2 bonded carbon. So it's important to note that when we're looking at uh, Raman spectroscopy as a technique and we're talking about graphene, it's not a single specific material, but a range or a family of materials that are closely related. And that's important to understand when we look at these techniques and some of the information that will be presented today is it's very specific depending on the type of graphene, the number of carbon layers that are being interrogated using the technique. And so with that, I'm very, very happy and proud to have Charles Clifford from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK and Angie Height Walker from NIST in the United States as our co-hosts. And I'm going to hand over um, to each of them now. Thank you very much, Terence. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, our masterclass on Raman spectroscopy of graphene. My name is Charles Clifford from the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, and I'm the co-host of uh, this webinar, along with my colleague, Angela Height-Walker from NIST in the US. Um, MPL is the National Metrology Lab in the UK, and we undertake a lot of uh, research and work in measurement and standardization of graphene. Uh, one of my roles is of a uh, project leader of the ISO G-Scope project, uh, which is co-organizing this meeting. Uh, the ISO G-Scope project is a large European project uh, devoted to developing standards in uh, graphene and related 2D materials. The agenda you can see on the screen, please put uh, comments and questions in the Q&A box, and we will answer those after all the talks. So questions will follow at the end of the meeting. The agenda you can see on the screen, uh, and without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce to you uh, my co-host and our first speaker, uh, Angie Height-Walker from, from NIST in the USA. Angie. Again, a big welcome to everyone who, um, who is here. We're excited that so many people are interested in Raman spectroscopy and particularly that uh, it's used to characterize graphene. So um, I am at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. We're the National Metrology Institute of the U.S., and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. What I'm going to talk about in this first um, small time is 
we actually have a team and it's an international Raman metrology team. And I just want to tell you a little bit about it. And, um, and also to, to offer if you have interest in, in it to, to actually join us um, because we're all inclusive and very welcoming for any experts. So the, the goal of the team is to really coordinate activities that are relevant to Raman metrology. And because I don't know, of course, um, everyone's background, metrology is really the scientific study of measurement. So we all are in the weeds, in the details, and really enjoy that aspect. Um, our ultimate goal is to work towards quantitative Raman spectroscopy. That would mean ultimate traceability to the SI. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So who is on this team? <laughs> so it is mainly national metrology institutes, just like Charles is at the NPL in the UK and I'm at NIST. Each country has a, um, an organization that coordinates its national standards. And we all have agreed through various um, various agreements to use this international system of units that's called the SI. And we're, we coordinate with one another underneath an organization referred to as the BIPM. And then this logo here is just showing you the seven units um, of measure underneath the SI. And some recent work in 2019 was done there. So if you're not familiar, please um, uh, have a look at that or ask any questions about it. And um, as you might have seen on the agenda, four of the NMIs in the world are going to talk to you today. Um, it's, it's just important to see that many, like the, the metrology of Raman for graphene is really an important topic to many of us. So obviously you've met myself and Charles from the UK. You're also going to hear from our colleagues at Inmetro, the NMI in Brazil, and our colleagues at NREM in Italy. But in no way think that only four NMIs are involved in the national, in our um, Raman metrology team, because it's actually quite broad. And I do want to do a special shout out to our Canadian colleagues who are very active. There just wasn't enough time to fit in everyone, as well, of course, as our Asian colleagues and, and everyone else. But importantly, I want to say, while mainly it's NMIs, we also have great work by universities, um, including Mathieu at Montpelier, who will actually speak today, and colleagues in Taiwan and Spain, and recently we've had a, a company join the calls. So um, I just want to say, if really Raman Metrology interests you, reach out, because it's a great team, we have a lot of fun. And so it's the broadest um, sort of example of all of all of this Raman work that you'll hear. So we have monthly calls and what do we actually discuss? <laughs> so our first thing is standards. And standards, there are two different meanings. One is a physical standard, like um, you know, an entity. And then of course there are documentary standards. Today, because we're we're short on time, we're not going to talk about physical. I'm only going to talk about documentary standards today. We also discuss and coordinate interlab studies. These are really important. You're going to hear about two today, one that's complete, one that's about to start. That's really the foundation for moving forward in metrology. Also, I'm going to give you a little bit on the BIPM, as I just mentioned before. And there's a specific committee underneath the BIPM that our team is active in. Of course, we also talk about meetings, presentation, and publications, but you don't need um, to, to know any more uh, about that. That's quite quite self-evident. So when it comes to documentary standards and Raman spectroscopy, it is all over the place, as hopefully you can see in this slide. But there are three main bodies that are working on standardization, documentary standards relevant for Raman spectroscopy. There are a number of TCs underneath ISO. So ISO is really the largest standards body. Underneath there, I've listed four TCs, technical committees, where Raman is being discussed, standardized, all sorts of things. Um, nanotechnology, which is one that both Charles and I are very active in, surface chemical analysis, plastics, as you can imagine, Raman and plastics is a whole nother exciting world, and water quality. Underneath the IEC, there is a committee called E113, and they are very focused on nanotechnology for electrotechnical uh, products and systems. 
as you can imagine, graphene is very active in a very important piece of the IEC documents. And ISO and IEC do have some joint committees. There's also ASTM International. You know, and that's really where some of the original Raman documents were developed. They were developed in E13, Molecular Spectroscopy and Separation Science. As you can imagine, coordinating all of this on a monthly basis is quite a lot, but it really helps us move things forward. I do want to mention that pharm pharma pharmacological products and Homeland Security are very important applications where they're using Raman, and the idea of making it more quantitative is so important to them. Interlab studies. I want to bring up a committee that's called VAMAS. I know there are so many acronyms in this talk, so don't, don't worry. You can go back and listen to it, and you're going to have the slides. VAMAS is a committee that organizes uh, interlab studies. And there are two important TWAs, those are technical working areas that are relevant to the call today. There is a whole working um, area on graphene and related 2D materials. They have over 14 projects. You're going to hear about some of those today. There is also a TWA focused solely on Raman spectroscopy and microscopy. We have five projects underway. I just want to give you a feel for how interlab studies happen from conception on. So there'll be a protocol developed, and it is essentially how to perform a measurement. That's really important. So often then a sample, a single sample set from a single NMI will be sent around to the participants, and they will have to follow the protocol and do the measurement and analysis as prescribed. Then the coordinator of the interlab study will analyze the data, determine sources of errors and insufficient information in that protocol. Then we often publish a paper about our results. We revise the protocol. Sometimes we need to retest it or we can move to the documentary standard draft stage. So working with Vomis is really the foundational work that then goes on to documentary standards. I just want to do one shout out. Um, and if you scan the QR code, you can participate in this survey. Um, one of the projects on the Raman side is we're really looking for factors that affect reproducibility in Raman. Again, this is not only focused on graphene. It's broader than that. Um, but please feel free to participate in this study. It's open to everyone. And lastly, one of the things we discuss is the BIPM and the CCQM, again, alphabet of acronyms. The Consultative Committee for the Amount of Substance, that is CCQM. And that's where you can imagine Raman would be an important piece. Again, this is underneath the BIPM. This is very official activities. Underneath VAMAS, we're a little more and then if that's great, we move on to key comparisons. And those are really important and official uh, documents and reports. With Raman, um, we, of course, we know that we want to be able to trace or to have an official amount of substance um, that's in the, in the sample that we're measuring. But as you can imagine, beyond the mole when it comes to Raman, you need to know how much material you're probing, so volume. And that actually is another unit of measure and therefore a different consultative committee. So I just am bringing up, it's really complicated, but it's a lot of fun to coordinate and work with people who really care about Raman metrology. Again, that long-term vision, quantitative Raman, traceable to the amount of substance or the mole. Again, thank you for your attention and please consider joining our team. And now, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Charles Clifford, who you uh, heard from in the beginning. He's at NPL, and he's going to talk about his project that's very European-focused, um, ISO G-Scope, that's very also focused on graphene broadly. Go ahead, Charles. Thank you, Angie. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the ISO G-Scope uh, project, which is co-organizing this event and also discussing international standardization uh, in graphene area in general. As Angie said, my name is Charles Clifford from the National Physical Laboratory. Um, and what is the need for standardization in, in the graphene area and in Raman spectroscopy? Well, we have hundreds of companies selling black powder here, 
that's claimed to be uh, uh, graphene. And the question we want to ask is, do we have graphene here or do we have graphite? That's the big uh, uh, question. And for that, we need to have standard, standard methods for being able to determine the structural and chemical properties of our black uh, powders and liquid dispersions as well. And so the ISO G-Scope project is a European uh, project involving uh, a large number of partners, including some of those on, on the call. And here we are focused on validation and standardization of measurement and characterization methods for chemical and structural properties of graphene, both in the powder form and also in liquid dispersions, and importantly, focused on industrial applications. So we have three main aims. The first is to lead and contribute to three documentary standards um, under ISO, looking at structural characterization of graphene, looking at chemical characterization of graphene and related 2D materials, and looking at structural characterization of graphene oxide with a focus on AFM and SEM techniques. Our second aim is to undertake uh, four international interlaboratory studies uh, to validate, to help validate these standards. And these are on XPS, SEM and AFM, um, Raman spectroscopy, which Chiara will talk about uh, later, this uh, interlab study, and on SEM of graphene oxide. Our third uh, aim is to work closely with end users and uh, including the graphene flagship and organizations such as the Graphene Council to really disseminate the outputs of this project. So in terms of standardization, um, this uh, slide just gives an overview of the uh, some of the standards, particularly with a focus on those developed under ISO, um, TC229. So we have a terminology standard. We have an overview technical report giving a measurement versus characteristics matrix. We have uh, a graphene blank detail specification under development, and we have the graphene classification framework uh, led by the Graphene Council that Terence uh, mentioned in the introduction. And then specifically, we have large standards for the measurement and of the structural characterization of CVD grown graphene, so graphene on a sheet uh, under development. And then we have three standards, large standards under development, looking at a uh, powder form of graphene, one on structural characterization, one on chemical characterization, and one on graphene oxide. Importantly, uh, we need standards on terminology um, so that people all talk the same language. So we have uh, a terminology document. This is freely available. Uh, Google ISO OBP uh, and type in ISO 80004-13 or just Google ISO TS 80004-13. Click on the preview uh, of the standard and you get the full uh, version of the standard, including some of these definitions, all of these definitions here. So we have definitions for two-dimensional materials where the number of layers is fixed uh, to 10 layers, one to 10 layers for a 2D material. We have a definition for graphene uh, defined as a single layer. 
but then we have our bilayer graphene and we also have few layer graphene which is three to ten well-defined stack graphene layers and we have around 97 additional terms defined in this standard along with abbreviated terms the revision of this terminology document is underway uh, new terms are expected such as graphene related 2D materials which encompasses all forms uh, such as graphene oxide reduced graphene oxide uh, functionalized versions of graphene and few layer graphene and then other terms such as graphene enhanced will also be uh, defined in terms of the measurement procedures we have ISO TS21356-1 looking at structural characterization of graphene powders. This was published a year or two ago, and this gives a flowchart order of methods for characterizing graphene uh, with a number of endpoints. And particularly, we should draw attention to the SEM AFM and Raman spectroscopy route here, which gives out the properties lateral size, thickness, and number of layers. And uh, this standard is nicely summarized in this publication here, um, and it gives suggested measurement protocols, sample preparation routines, and data analysis. Um, Part of this uh, standard, especially the measurement protocols, are now being validated in more detail. And we're doing this via interlaboratory studies that Angie introduced, where we send out uh, a set of known samples internationally to people to, to measure. And uh, we're doing this for SEM and AFM and Raman spectroscopy. Uh, for SEM and AFM, we're sending out graphene flakes uh, and asking participants to measure these flakes with both AFM and SEM and report lateral size and thickness. And the aim here is to understand measurement issues and reduce uncertainties and then feed into the revision of that standard. Another standard is the chemical characterization standard. I won't go into this in too much detail, but this uses XPS, X-ray photoelectros spectroscopy to give you elemental composition and oxygen to carbon ratio information, and as well as looking at additional techniques listed here to get functional groups, looking at trace metals and amount of impurities. And there's currently an interlab study about to be launched here using XPS to look at functionalized graphene. So to summarize briefly, uh, the community uh, needs standards, uh, documentary standards of industrial importance to enable everyone to give valid and repeatable results. Uh, so that we can know what our black material is. We need standards in terminology and we need standards in measurement and characterization as well. And we test and validate these methods and standards using VAMAS interlaboratory studies where appropriate. Um, so thank you very much for listening to that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the ISO G-Scope uh, project for, for funding here. And with that, uh, we will move on to our next speaker and really the three main talks of the sessions talking about uh, Raman spectroscopy. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Erlon from Inmetro in Brazil to talk about are giving us an introduction to Raman spectroscopy. Erlon. Thank you, Charles. 
And hello, everyone. My name is Erlon Ferreira. I'm a researcher from IMETRO, the National Institute of Metrology in Brazil. Uh, I work on optical spectroscopy of dense materials, especially in carbon nanomaterials. And I will give a very brief introduction to Raman spectroscopy and explain what's the origin of this phenomenon and what kind of information can derive from that. So Raman scattering is one of the many different ways that light, and more generally, electric magnetic radiation can interact with matter. When a ray of light encounters a surface, there are basically three options. It can be transmitted, absorbed, or reflected. Each of those options can give rise to different physical phenomena, depending on the type of the material and the type of the electromagnetic radiation. So Sir Raman first observed this phenomenon when he was studying the scattering of light through liquids. His notes is that when the light interacts with the liquid, a new type of radiation appears. In a very simple apparatus, he has used the two complementary filters to prove that the part of the scattered light has a different color of the incident light. In these pictures, we can see what he's got in his experiment. In this first plate, we observe the solar line from a mercury lamp. But when you put a vial of carbon tetrachloride in front of it, you observe additional lines. This means light with different wavelengths and hence different energy of the incident light. So what is the origin of this new radiation? In a very simple way, we can describe light to use the concept of classical physics. When two opposing charges form a dipole oscillate, they produce oscillating electric and magnetic fields that propagate in space. That's, this is what we call electric magnetic radiation. Invisible light is just the part of the electric magnetic spectrum between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. The bond of atoms and molecules can be depicted as dipoles as well as the charge distribution tends to be non-homogeneous along the bonded. Depending on the molecule, the sum of dipole moment of all bonds can be zero, as, as in carbon dioxide, or non-zero, as in water. In the latter case, we say that the molecule has an intrinsic dipole moment. However, even for a molecule with no net dipole moment, we can induce a dipole moment when the molecule is placed in an external electric field. The intensity and the direction of this induced dipole moment depends on both the electroesternal field and a property of the molecule called polarizability. So if you take the external field to oscillate with a frequency, let's say omega zero, and also assume that the polarizability changes with the molecular vibration. So the polarizability will oscillate with the vibration frequency omega of this bond oscillation, so you can calculate how the molecular dipole moment varies with time. We see here that there are three components for this dipole moment. One oscillates with the same frequency of the external field, and the two other, they oscillate with different frequencies that are shifted by the frequency of the molecular vibration. That means that the molecule will emit light with the same frequency of the incident light, called Rayleigh scattering but it will also emit light with a slightly different frequency. That's the origin of the Raman scattering. We name Stokes the scattered light with lower frequency and anti-Stokes the one with the higher frequency. So we can also understand the Raman scattering using quantum mechanics. In this case, we must observe that in molecules, you have not only the electronic states, but also the vibrant states, represented here by these small lines inside the electronic states. They, the, the, this vibrant state really represent additional degrees of freedom due to oscillation of atoms forming the molecule. And the separation between those states, they, they have the energy in the region of the infrared radiation. So in this representation, we see that a photon of visible light, they can excite an electron from a fundamental state to a state of much higher energy, much above this vibrant state. When the electron returns to the original state, this initial state, it emits the say, a photon with the same energy of the incident photon. That's the ray scattering. So the incident and the scattered light have the same energy. There's no difference. But however, there is a small probability that when the excited electron decays, uh, they decay not to the original state, but to an excited vibrant state. In this case, the emitted photon will have a small smaller energy than the incident photon. That's the stoke Raman scattering. Similarly, the incident photon can interact with an electron that is already in an excited state. And when it decays, it goes to a fundamental state of lower energy. So 
the scattered photon now has more energy than the, the incident one. In both cases, measuring the difference in energy of incident and scattered photons gives information about the vibrant states of the molecule. In other words, Raman spectroscopy can probe the energy of the vibrational modes of a material. So let's have a look again at the spectrum of carbon tetrachloride. We know that the molecule has four distinct normal modes of vibration, each with a different energy, and hence a frequency or wave number, as we typically represent in spectroscopy. Each of these vibration modes gives orange to two lines in the Raman spectrum, the Stokes and anti-Stokes line, one to the left and the, other to the right of the spectrum of the center line, that's the Rayleigh scattering. The Roman spectrum is represented typically in a graph where the Rayleigh line is at zero wave number. So it won't depend on the energy of the instant light. In this way, this position of the bands are already the difference in wave number between the incident and scattered photons, and they represent the energy of the corresponding vibrational modes. Very quickly, when studying solid materials, we have to consider the collective vibration of all atoms in a crystal lattice. Very similarly to molecules, you can find the normal modes of vibration in the solids, where the atomic displacement follows some kind of wave motions. These lattice excitation are called phonons, in analogy to the electric magnetic excitation called photons. Phonons are quasi particles that represent the quanta of vibrational energy in the crystal and are related to the normal modes of vibration. Their frequency or wavelength will depend on the crystal structure. The Raman process in solids can be understood as a scattering involving three steps. In the first moment, a photon excites an electron from the valence band. Then this electron can inelastically scatter a phonon using some energy and then returns to the initial states emitting a photon. We can measure the phonon energy by the difference in energy between the incident and scattering photon. So just to close here, I present two typical Raman spectra of pristine graphene and of graphene with defects. The G band is related to this CC in plane stratum mode. So this collective vibrational normal mode of vibration in, in the, the crystal. And the D and 2D bands are related to the ring briefing modes uh, in the lattice of the carbon in the lattice. On the right, you see the schematic representation of the Raman scattering for each of those bands. But you get more details on that in the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Erlan. <clears throat> Great presentation. And now we're getting into getting in deep to the Raman spectroscopy of graphene. Our next speaker is Keith. Uh, he is also at NPL in the UK. And he's going to um, get us um, into specifically uh, the graphene, the Raman of graphene, and talk about the outcomes of one of the interlab studies that we've completed. Go ahead, Keith. You can all see that. And uh, thank you for for, to Ellen for that introduction to uh, the fundamentals of, of Raman spectroscopy um, itself, um, and also touching on the, the, the origin of the Raman spectrum of, of graphene itself. Um, so in this talk, I will briefly introduce graphene production, but not go into details, just highlight the different forms of the material that has been mentioned already. I'll then introduce the Raman spectrum uh, of uh, graphene and related 2D materials. Um, and then start talking about the physical interpretation. What does this spectrum actually tell you about your material that you're, you're interested in? Um, I'll then, as, as Angie mentioned, describe some of the results of the VAMA study that we undertook uh, on Raman spectroscopy of CVD graphene and some of the key findings that we, we got from that study. So graphene, I mean, hopefully to this audience, we don't need to introduce graphene uh, in too much detail, um, but I, what I wanted to emphasize is that this is a material that is being used now in commercial products. You can go into the marketplace and buy uh, products that contain uh, graphene, uh, whether that's headphones, bike tires, or even cars. Um, so the Ford Mustang now contains graphene materials. 
And as that is being increasingly commercialized, that just highlights the importance of having really robust, reliable, believable measurement techniques that, that different users can rely on so that they understand what they're getting when they see a value on a data sheet, for example. So as has been mentioned, there are different forms of graphene. We talk about graphene sometimes if it's this one material or material form, there are different ways of, of producing it that produces material in, with very different properties. Um, and those methods have differences in terms of scalability, the level of defects or disorder that you have in the resulting material, the cost of production, but maybe most importantly, the compatibility with the end application. What is this material going to be used in? Um, so, I mean, we try not to use the term good quality or bad quality graphene um, because it really is dependent on what you're going to be using it for. But broadly, these materials can be split into two different groups, either graphene on a substrate, and these, this form is typically produced by uh, CBD, so chemical vapor deposition, where we start with a hydrocarbon gas, we crack that onto a substrate, leaving behind this sp 2 uh, graphene lattice. And if you do it right, you get monolayer growth uh, on your substrate that can then be transferred uh, to where you need it. The second broad class is the, the powders or dispersions that, that Charles mentioned, where you start with uh, graphite generally, and you break that down in a variety of techniques, whether that's sonication, high shear mixing, microfluidization, and you end up with, with small flakes of generally few layer graphene um, that you can then use uh, for your applications. Um, so that's often used, referred to as liquid phase exfoliation because typically it's carried out in liquids. There are also still some studies and some of the results in this presentation will be using um, mechanically exfoliated uh, graphene where we uh, use uh, adhesive tape and sticky tape to peel off layers of, of graphene. Um, but that's obviously not a, a commercially <laughs> feasible uh, way of producing uh, graphene. So we've seen this, this kind of spectrum a few times already. Um, this is the, the typical spectrum that you would get from, from graphene, and this is from commercial CBD graphene, um, and it is uh, slightly defective, so we've got the D peak here. But the main peaks are labeled, so the G peak, which we see typically from uh, almost any graphitic uh, material. The 2D peak is generally always seen as well. You will see it sometimes referred to as the G prime peak, though the, the 2D is, is becoming even uh, increasingly standard as the, as the terminology for that peak. And then this, this D peak, which um, will go into the, the origins of, of where that comes from um, in a moment. And there's some other peaks as well. So the D prime is related to the D peak. I also wanted to show the spectrum that you would typically get from fuel layer graphene. So this is measured not on individual flakes of fuel layer graphene. This is uh, almost like a bulk sample of, of material. So in a single Raman measurement here, you're, you're probing multiple plate, flakes or so hundreds to thousands of, of flakes in a single measurement. So you can see that the, the deep peak is more in, uh, enhanced, so it's, it's high intensity relative to the G peak. The 2D peak is much lower, it's broader, but still shows this symmetrical shape. And some of these combination modes are also uh, more enhanced as well. So where do these peaks come from? So Erlon uh, mentioned these, uh, these phonon modes, these vibrational modes that, that give rise to these Raman uh, peaks. So the G peak is coming from this uh, in-plane uh, vibrations uh, with dissimilar uh, carbon atoms vibrating in, in opposite directions. And then the D-band and the 2D band are both originate from this ring breathing mode where the, the atoms of a ring go in and out in, in sync with each other. So if they're both coming from this, this single vibrational mode. Why are they shown at such uh, different wavelengths, such different uh, frequencies? Well, it comes from this, again, uh, this uh, uh, electronic structure. So the, the 2D band, um, we, there's a, 
requirement for Raman spectroscopy that there's no change in momentum from start and end states. So for the 2D band, we can get scattering off one phonon and then scattering off a second phonon. So it's a two phonon process. And because of that, you get a large frequency shift. The D, D peak is a single phonon scattering, which doesn't give a, a zero change in momentum. What we need to get that is scattering off a defect in the lattice. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss what I mean by defect in, in the next slide. Um, but this is why you don't always see the D peak, even when you do see the, the 2D band in the spectrum. So we can see quite clear differences between the spectrum of, of graphene, this is single layer graphene and graphite, and this primarily shows up in the, the shape and position of the, this 2D band. So for single layer graphene, you see a, a symmetric uh, peak with a narrow width, typically, whereas for graphite, you see this distinctive shoulder uh, on the 2D band and the low frequency inside of the 2D band. Um, which is generally fitted quite well to, uh, to two peaks rather than a single uh, peak shape. And as you go from single layer graphene to bilayer graphene and three layer graphene and so on up to uh, 10 layer and then graphite, unfortunately in these uh, two figures, the authors have uh, ordered the number of layers in, in opposite directions. The, the, the shape of that peak, the position, the width uh, evolves as I say, up to about 10 layers and beyond 10 layers, it's very difficult to distinguish anything more than that uh, to try and get structural information about your material. So while that's useful to know the microscopic origin of these peaks, what can we actually learn about a material from, from them? So I mentioned that the D band is activated by defects and defects can include vacancies, SB3 bonding, but also edges of, of graphene uh, sheets and that, graphene flakes. So don't think of defects as necessarily a bad thing. They can be useful and enhance the properties of your material in, in, a, in an application. But you can use this, the intensity of the D peak normalized to the intensity of the G peak to understand the, the, uh, the concentration of defects or the, the spacing between defects in, in the material. So this is what we published a few years ago where we took uh, mechanical exfoliated uh, graphene flakes, introduced defects controllably using iron bombardment, um, and we can use different uh, ions to give different sizes of defects, um, and then track how that intensity of the D-peak changes. And you can see a very, very well-behaved um, uh, signature and uh, relationship between that intensity ratio and the, the distance between the defects. But you can see that the, exactly the, the form of that uh, relationship is dependent on the, the size of the defect. And for a given intensity ratio, you can get uh, that corresponds to a different uh, defect spacing. So it's important to notice that you can't use the D over G ratio in isolation. You need to understand uh, other aspects of the spectrum or bring in other characterization tools for your uh, material to fully understand what's going on in your in your material. Um, and there are details for the fitting of this, uh, the, this data in, in the paper here. So that was from the mechanically exfoliated uh, material um, for perhaps a more industrially relevant uh, uh, material where we're getting um, mass production, uh, you can also get uh, information about the lateral size of these flakes. So this is for liquid phase exfoliated material, lateral size and thickness, mean thickness of the flakes that you've got in your material. Again, for the lateral size, what we're relying on is this DP is uh, activated by flake edges. So if you have smaller flakes, you have more uh, edges relative to the basal plane material. So this D over G ratio will change and it changes in a uh, very well-defined uh, behavior that can be used to, to get a quantitative measure of the mean lateral size in your material. And again, the, the shape of this 2D peak, although we're measuring 
with sampling multiple flakes, you know, hundreds of thousands of flakes in a measurement, um, the shape of that can be deconvoluted and with simple metrics be used to, to predict the, the average number of layers in your, in your material, which echoes what we see with uh, mechanically exfoliated flakes. But again, these metrics start to break down above about 10 layers as it does for, for the mechanically exfoliated flakes. So it's important to understand the limitation, the power, but also the limitations of Raman spectroscopy when you're using it to characterize your material. So we also see changes in the spectrum um, if we apply strain to the, to the material. So Raman spectroscopy, we're prob probing vibrational modes. As you stretch your material, the frequency of that vibrational mode will change. And it changes in quite um, well explained and well understood uh, directions. And this can be used, for example, if you are uh, trying to optimize uh, material for reinforcement of composites, where you can use Raman spectroscopy to effectively probe the strain in a single uh, flake uh, embedded in a polymer and understand the, the stress transfer then it, from the matrix into the into the flakes to understand how to optimize that reinforcement effect of the flakes. One problem is that as well as um, peak shifts coming from strain, doping will also change the, the position of, of some of those peaks and often in the same direction. But we, what we can do is instead of you tracking just a sink position of a single peak, we can track the relative changes of two peaks so the G peak and the 2D peak and that relative position change is different for doping and strain, which allows us to separate those, those two effects. But again, but again, it just highlights some of the complexity and understanding of Raman spectrum. It's in some ways a really easy method to carry out and take a measurement, very difficult to interpret um, accurately and reliably. So Charles and, and Angie have, have both mentioned um, the development of, of standards in this area and into laboratory studies. Um, so I won't go over that in, again in too much detail, but it is important to understand what the uncertainty in a measurement typically is. So if you're comparing two data sheets, is a real, are you seeing a real difference or is that the kind of expected uncertainty and, and variation you would get from different measurements? And this uncertainty can come from various sources, different instrumentation, different users, and exactly how they set up the instrument, and also data analysis, exactly how you, how you fit the data that you fit. You, you fit. Um, so we can try and tease out the sources of those and quantify them and ultimately reduce them, those uncertainties by doing, uh, carrying out into laboratory studies. Um, and I'll do Describe the one that we completed and, and published. Uh, well, we published the paper last year. We completed it a couple of years ago, um, that is feeding into the, uh, the the measurement standard that, that Charles mentioned. So the way the this study was was structured is we took uh, a sample of CVD graphene that had been transferred onto a silicon wafer. We cut that up into smaller samples and sent participants. Um, one sample each and ask them to measure two locations on each of these on, on the sample that they were sent. So that each participant both measured the sample and then analyzed the data. As the lead participant, we at NPL then measured the same area on the wafer and anal analyzed that, but also analyzed the raw data that the participant sent back. And that allowed us to separate the effects of measurement and data analysis uh, to understand where the, the sources of those uncertainties came from. So the first parameter that we looked at, the first metric that we examined was uh, the, the peak intensity ratio of the 2D peak to the G peak. Um, as we've seen that is a, a good indicator of the, the number of layers, and certainly for CVD, it's a good indicator of whether you have monolayer graphene or, or bilayer graphene. Uh, in your sample. And as you would expect, we saw variations due to measurements. Every measurement has an uncertainty. And when you're doing that measurement with different users, different instruments, you would expect uh, to see a, a variation. Um, 
and we saw some participants were with showed more variation from from our measurements and one participant was a definite outlier um, with good understanding of, of why in terms of the, their setup of their instrument but what we see is the measurement differences do show very wide range of, of values that we get we saw a, a root mean squared error of 0.7 uh, uh, from across the, the different participants whereas the data analysis as we were hoping, showed almost no difference. So it didn't matter whether we analyzed the data or the participants, uh, we generally got pretty bang on to the same results compared to the measurement differences. So we started trying to pick out where these differences in the measurements actually come from. And we noticed that two of the, the two participants that had the smallest difference between their measurements and our measurements were the participants that had corrected their instruments for the instrument response. So what is this instrument response uh, correction that needs done? So every instrument has optical components, whether that's lenses, mirrors, uh, gratings, filters, that have um, a, resp a, a response that varies with wavelength. So they're not pure, uh, you know, they're not 100% transmission at all wavelengths. And the detectors that are used to detect the scattered photons also don't have a uniform um, efficiency with wavelength. So combined, um, what you measure isn't necessarily what is being emitted. Um, and that combined is this instrument uh, response function. Um, and that's what you need to correct. And there's a few ways you can do it. The two main ones are either take a calibrated white light source that emits white light and the emission of that is calibrated traceably back to, to primary standards or secondary reference materials or so certified reference materials such as uh, the uh, samples that are, are produced and, and sold by, by NIST, by uh, Angie and her colleagues, um, which is what we use uh, at NPL. And the basis of, of both approaches is that you have a, uh, uh, an expected, a certified emission that you're expected, expecting. So this is shown in the black curve here. On your individual spectrometer, you can record the spectrum that you get. And the difference between that can be used to get uh, an instrument response correction function. And you can then apply that function to all the uh, spectra that you measure to allow measurements to be uh, compared more accurately between different users and when we apply this to a d over g rate 2d over g ratio we find a, a correction of of 10 percent so it's not an insignificant correction factor that you need to, to apply so it is really important to apply this to your uh, samples and your, to your uh, spectrometer the second parameter we looked at was the width of this 2d peak um, which again is related can be related to uh, layer thickness, but also uh, strain. So again, we saw measurement the variation from measurements, which we would expect, but this time we did see some quite significant uh, variation from uh, the analysis. So simply taking the data and analyzing it uh, by different people using different analysis packages. So looking into this, one participant um, fitted their data to a VoIT function, and they showed very uh, low variation in the values that they, they got. So we looked at this in more detail using fitting a, one, a single data set to either Lorentzian peaks or to VoIT or pseudo VoIT peaks using a range of different analysis packages, either commercial packages or uh, custom uh, scripts. And what we found was that when we use the pseudo VoIT, the values we get are very consistent across different analysis packages compared to using our Lorentzian function. So if you want re reliable and cons consistent fitting, really the pseudo VoIT gives much better uh, consistency across different analysis packages. Um, we also saw a reduction in variation where we fit the peaks individually rather than trying to fit all the peaks across the spectrum um, in a single uh, fitting process. So I've rushed over that last couple of slides a little bit, so my apologies, I took maybe too long on the, the early side, 
But I just wanted to highlight that Raman spectroscopy could be really as a powerful method, but there are challenges and intricacies in the interpretation. And I think the, the next talk will, will maybe highlight some, some more detailed uh, caveats and, and, and uh, challenges in interpreting. Um, but we can get uh, information about material from the, the Raman spectroscopy, but really we need international standards and interlaboratory studies to understand the, the variation in values that we get and standardize the way that people carry out these measurements. So I just want to thank uh, some of my NPL co-workers that, that contributed to this work. Thank Angie and, and Erlon who, who gave valuable insight in terms of setting up the, the VAMA study protocol and in writing of the paper and all the participants to, who actually carried out these measurements and provided the data um, as well as some of the funding bodies. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. That was a great uh, introduction to using Raman spectroscopy to characterize graphene. And uh, we move on to our next talk, uh, which is given by uh, Matteo Palais from the University de Montpellier and CNRS in France. And he's going to be talking about uh, advanced analysis and, and really the caveats of imaging graphene using Raman spectroscopy. So, Amatio, the floor's yours. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Yes, I am Mathieu Payet from CNRS and University of Montpellier in France. So, at, as it was said uh, already several times, uh, Raman is a very powerful tool to, to, to access to a wealth of information about graphene, uh, about its structure, its properties, but you can also with it follow up the effect of perturbations of such doping, strain, etc. And if you add to this large variety of production techniques or substrate on which the graphene can lie on and so on, it can be very complex to, to get an accurate and reliable interpretation of, of what you get from Raman. So in this talk, I will try to, to Review a bit what uh, where the complexity come from, where we need to take uh, care. So I, I divide it in three different categories. The first will come from the experimental conditions that are using. The other one from the the, the samples. Well, the last one was uh, already uh, uh, presented by Keith. So it's about data acquisition and treatment. So if I start with the the, the setup. So I present on this slide uh, uh, the result of a very long mapping of uh, several hours of uh, 20,000 of points on a regular RAM and setup, so the, the commercial one. So you have here an optical micrograph of sample. This is mechanically exfoliated graphene with a different uh, 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 contrast coming from different uh, uh, sicknesses. So as you see on this map here from where we extract the, the the G peak intensity, you can see there's a, a strong uh, uh, modulation of the signal. And as you see on, on this profile, even for a, a, a given number of layers, you can have a strong uh, fluctuations. And if we look at the substrate now, so here we have the, the signal from the silicon, which is an anisographene. Uh, apart from the, 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 where the, the graphene flakes are, you can see that you still have a large fluctuation of the intensity, about 20%. And even if we track the position of the silicon peak, which is not supposed to move, you can have a difference in the, in the, in the frequency, in the wave number, by about 2 centimeter minus 1. So you can have strong fluctuation of intensity and peak position. So this can happen in some experiment. And this is due to, to the stability of the setup. So you really need to take care that the, 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 the experiment time uh, fits with the stability of your experiment. On our side, to try to circumvent this limitation, we have made an, an uh, on-made setup where we can not only measure Raman, but also uh, a reflection. So this means the laser light, the power of laser light reflected by the sample. 
We can also on, on um, transparent substrate measure the transmission of the laser. And on each point of the map, we also measure the laser power so that we can get rid of the laser fluctuation, we can be, which can be an, a source of error also and intensity measured. Furthermore, we uh, really take care about the stability of the setup. This means that we control the temperature of the experiment uh, down to uh, 0 0.1 degrees Celsius. So this allows to make very long maps for large statistics. And uh, since intensity is also of interest, uh, we also need uh, some reference. And for this, we use a, a, a graphite HOPG sample of high quality uh, to normalize the, the intensity we measure. This is also very important when we want to compare results from a setup to another to have a, a, an internal calibration. So here I give you a, an, another example of a, a similar sample of exfoliate graphene and the map that was done on this setup. So here you have the Raman map, the same as before, and uh, but normalized by the HOPG signal. And here you have the optical contrast, which is uh, uh, calculated from the reflection of the laser. So as you can see on these profiles, we have very uh, low noise uh, on, on this measurement. So for each layer, the measurements are very consistent and flat. Both uh, maps look very similar. And actually, the, the key is really the thermal stability of the setup which uh, circumvent problem with uh, focus or laser pointing or any drift of, of the experiment. And of course, the uh, normalization by the incident laser power also uh, uh, lower the error on the measurement. So this is just to show you that we can do map up to an uh, inch square scale. So for this, you also need uh, to, to uh, correct from the, the plane of the sample because on such large scale, of course, the sample is not perfectly flat, but we can do this. So now I will go to uh, other uh, consideration regarding the setup. And once I want to, to, to mention here is uh, to answer the question, if the Raman is really uh, as a non-invasive technique as uh, it's uh, assumed uh, in the literature. So for this, I will talk about the effect of the laser. So I just put this article here just to show you that if you put a huge laser power, of course, you can burn graphene. So you can uh, 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 simmer uh, graphene, uh, uh, few layers graphene than to the model layer. But to 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 look at what happens when we use much more moderate uh, power, which are commonly used to characterize grassing, we conduct this experiment uh, on, two, uh, on, on this kind of sample where one part of the graphene is supported on the substrate and the other one is suspended. And we uh, did some spectra different powers on these two points. So here I show you different spectrum at different spectra, sorry, uh, at different power. And uh, so you can see that we don't induce defect in this experiment with moderate powers. We analyze the peak as it was shown before. So we on the G peak, the 2D peak, uh, regarding its uh, uh, integrate intensity, its uh, position, wave number, and uh, the width, and also the ratio between the intensity of the 2D and the G. So on the uh, on the suspended part, I won't say much, but we just saw a uh, simple eating effect of the graphene. So the laser is uh, uh, eating graphene, so not much more to say. But on the uh, supported part, we see a much more complex behavior. So I put here two uh, parameters we extract. So the shift of the G-peak and the width of the G-peak as the function of the laser power. So this is uh, uh, starts here at low power and goes in and, and, and forth. And uh, it, when we compare to what was uh, measured in the literature regarding uh, doping of graphene, we could figure out that actually the graphene is speed up at low power, but goes down to intrinsic and then to N. So we, we show that uh, actually there's a reflect, uh, reversible optical doping occurring there. So depending on the power you put, you can change the doping state of your graphene. So this can have an uh, incidence on, on the map. I, we just show here quickly. So different random quantities on, on each line as a function of power for each colon. And just visually, you can see that uh, each map at different power looks different. So this can uh, have an incidence. 
Uh, another practical issue is actually uh, uh, shown here. So usually when you want to make the focus on your sample, you look at the height of your peak, so the uh, intensity I, but due to this doping effect, you can see on, 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 this, uh, uh, on this graph that this, this is the red uh, uh, dots. So if we change the, the, the focus, the Z, and we look at this intensity, you see that there is a complex behavior and the optimized focus regarding this uh, uh, parameter will be here. But if we look at the integrated intensity of the peak, which is the, the, the black squares, then you see that the correct focus is here because this parameter is independent of doping. So to summarize, due to this uh, reversible optical doping effect, you can be wrong by looking at the G-peak intensity. So this will not happen all the time, but this can happen. So I will now move to uh, another aspect. So as you know, graphene is only surface atoms, so it's extremely sensitive to uh, the, its direct environment. So I will talk a bit about the subtract effect. This can have effect on many things, such as the Raman intensity, the doping strain states of your graphene, and other stuff. So starting with intensity, it's, it's well known that when you put graphene, on a, a, a silicon, uh, silicon oxide substrate, you can have a, a, an, an enhancement of its contrast, and this is how it was seen uh, initially. And so, if we look here at the uh, at the, um, intense, the Raman intensity, so for the G peak or the 2D peak, as a function of the laser wavelength you use, you use and as a function of the silicon thickness of your, your substrate, you see uh, that compared to graphene in air, you can have uh, either um, one order of magnitude enhancement of the signal or uh, one order of magnitude lowering of the signal. So this means that you really need to choose correctly these two parameters to uh, uh, get good uh, measurement condition. Furthermore, you see here that even this uh, 2D over Z ratio can be influenced by the thickness. This comes from the fact that the G peak and the 2D peak are not uh, coming from the same wavelengths. And of course, this is all related to interference effects that play a major role on this kind of, of substrate. But this will also be the case on, on copper, copper oxide uh, samples, for example. Um, just quickly, uh, what uh, is here just to show you that if you transfer graphene, for example, CVD graphene made on copper using a polymer like PMMA, and if there is a lot of residue, you can also have an influence on the Raman intensity of the, the sample of the Raman signature. So this is uh, shown on, the, on this graph where there was quite a lot of PMMA here. You can see here that the optical contrast as a function of wavelengths will strongly change. So the sample is in blue with uh, PMMA residue and is compared with uh, an exfoliated graphene, so one without residue on the same substrate. Uh, on other uh, substrates, you have different uh, problematics. So, for example, on silicon carbide here, uh, as you see here in, in, in black on this spectrum, you have a huge uh, intensity coming from the substrate in just in the region when you want to measure the G-peak and the D-peak. So for this kind of sample, you will need to, to have proper uh, subtraction of the uh, substrate background to, uh, to isolate the, uh, properly the signal of your uh, graphene sample. So now I will go to... Uh, uh, one of the main use of Raman, which is the, the to count the number of layers of graphene you have. So initially, several parameters was, were, were used. So starting from the seminal work of Ferrari and Mayer that was already mentioned, it was shown that the 2B peak change uh, strongly with the number of layers. So these uh, studies were done on exfoliated Bernal or rhomboidal uh, uh, samples. And there was uh, initially three metrics that uh, were um, used in the literature. So uh, just simply by looking at the width of the 2D peak, it is uh, uh, the lowest for the one layer graphene and goes up with a number of layers. The uh, ratio between the 2D and G peak intensity uh, is maximum from the monolayer graphene and goes down with a number of layers on this kind of sample. Uh, another parameter was also the, the G-peak integrate intensity, 
Uh, this is related to the fact that the G band is the first order Raman process. So in principle, its uh, its intensity should be proportional to the to the number of scattered, so to the the number of of uh, uh, layer. So if there's some, I, I will show you now the problem we have with this metric. So first, regarding the 2D over Z ratio, it was shown in many papers that this ratio is changed uh, with doping and goes down with the, the, the doping of the graphene. So this is a problem if you want to count layers because you don't always know the doping state of your, of your graphene. As I've shown before, uh, optical interference can also change this ratio. So we have a first problem here. Uh, Regarding the 2D peak width, uh, the strain fluctuation can also have a, a be problematic. So it's shown in, in this paper here. So the, the, they, they measure the intrinsic width of the 2D peak of graphene, that is about 16 centimeter minus one. However, uh, very often the graphene is, is not uh, is a strain. And there is strength fluctuation at the nanometer scale. So this means at, uh, at a scale much smaller than the spot size you, you are using in your Raman experiment. And by doing your experiment, you are uh, summing, averaging all the different uh, 2DP coming from all this uh, uh, little piece of graphene in different strength configuration. And this is responsible for an increase in the 2D line width. And um, so this can be useful because it was shown that the 2D weights can be related to device mobility. So this has been exploited in uh, IEC standards where this strain uniformity uh, can be uh, used to, to access to the device uh, quality. However, uh, this also means that when the, 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 there is strong uh, strain fluctuation, like for example, on, on silicon carbine, you can have a very large 2D peak even for one layer graphene. So in other words, a monolayer can really look like a monolayer if we look at the uh, 2D uh, bandwidth. Um, other uh, problems come from the starting order of the of the samples. So uh, what I in the similar work, uh, Rambo-Edral and Bernal uh, stacking sample were used. So this is the most stable form. However, uh, also uh, twisted and misoriented layers also exist and are uh, very often uh, found in uh, CVD graphene, for example. So what is the problem is that. Uh, here I show you uh, an experiment uh, conducted on, on graphene and compared to uh, misorienting graphene and you see that the 2D peak of misoriented layer graphene looks very similar to the graphene. It's actually very narrow and a single peak. And actually, if you look here at turbostatic graphite, you can also see that you find uh, this kind of uh, symmetric and, and uh, and rather narrow peak as compared to HOPG uh, graphite. So to illustrate this uh, more deeper, I show you an experiment we conducted on, on, this, on this piece of graphene where you have two flowers with a different number of layers. So you see the flowers are very symmetric looking on the optical micrograph or on the optical contrast. But when we look at the 2D over G ratio or the 2D bandwidth, you see they are uh, completely uh, uh, different. So I, I, I show you here different uh, 2D peaks for the two different regions. So for two layers, three layers, four layers, you see that you can have either a very narrow 2D peak as well as a large uh, 2D peak. So in other words, a multi-layer can really look like a monolayer when looking at the 2D. So this is actually due to statting, and here I summarize the dependency of the 2D peak weeks as a function of the rotation angle between the layers. So you see that if you use this matrix at 35 centimeter minus one uh, to distinguish between a layer and multi-layer, you see that you will be wrong in 50% of the twist angle for by layer. So, and it will be probably worse for more layers. And it is the same for the 2D over G ratio. Uh, for the, the G peak, there is also problems, and one comes from the fact that uh, for certain angle of twist, there is a, there can be a, a resonance in the visible that we strongly enhance the G peak. So this means it will not uh, not be any more proportional to the middle layer, but it can be two two order of magnitude uh, 
larger than a monolayer in a twist, twisted bilayer for a given angle. So at the end, uh, the conclusion of that is that, uh, unfortunately, there is no absolute Raman criterion to count the number of layers. Uh, but uh, the, this uh, normalized G peak intensity has a, a, a big advantage compared to the 2D one is that these problems come on, only for, uh, from multi layers. So this means that this, this uh, matrix will al always be able to, dis to discriminate sorry, between mono and multi layer graphene. You will not always be able to count the layers, but we will always know. Uh, that is more than one layer or not. Uh, so this, this is summarized here. So to 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 set the standards, what we've done actually, uh, starting from this fact that there's no absolute Raman criterion, uh, we uh, favor to uh, use a combination of elastic and elastic scattering. So this means the uh, um, laser uh, contrast and uh, Raman, so the G peak intensity. And if both methods agrees, we know that the number of layer can be specified, but if they disagree, we know that we cannot specify the, the number of layers. So this is a way to be foolproof, to be to have a reliable method, but it cannot always count the number of layer. Anyway, we will be always uh, able to say if it's a mono or multi-layer. So this is the, the, the scope of this uh, uh, document that is uh, under uh, revision under the uh, IEC. So uh, we also needed to limit the, the, the application of the standards regarding the, the substrate. So it's only uh, for uh, a few layer graphene on glass or on a silicon, silicon oxide substrate with a silica thickness of 90 nanometers. It's limited to up to five layers and also to high quality graphene, as I said before, with no residue and also with rather uh, small defect. So with that, I, I thank you for your attention and I acknowledge all the people that participate to this work. Thank you, Matthew. Very uh, important message that hopefully people learned a lot about some of these caveats. Uh, so now we have um, a presentation by Chiara from our um, sister NMI in Italy, Enrim, and she's going to talk about a round robin study that's about to take place and invite you to consider to participate. Chiara, over to you. Thank you, Angie. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Chiara Cortesi from the Italian Metrological Institute, and uh, as Angela said, I'm um, here to present uh, our study and to invite you to participate. This study is uh, about uh, the validation of Raman spectroscopy as a technique uh, for uh, uh, characterizing graphene in a number of uh, in the number of layers. This work is uh, has been organized in the framework of the ISO G scope project, which is led by NPL and the, the that the coordinator Charles Clifford has uh, previously presented. And uh, the, pro the comparison is uh, the main uh, one of the two tasks of the work package free of the project uh, led by INRIM and the work is carried out by me and uh, my colleague Alessio Sacco, which is uh, the Raman expert at, uh, at INRIM. The proposal of, for, of the study has been submitted to the uh, TWA41 uh, in uh, Bahamas and uh, for approval, and it, it has been approved as a project 11. And uh, later on, it became uh, a, a joint uh, project uh, between the TWA41 and the TWA42 about Raman spectroscopy due to the large interest of the Raman metrology community that uh, Angie presented uh, in the first uh, presentation and uh, that want to, uh, to be involved uh, in, uh, in the study, was interested in the results. Uh, the objectives of, of the study, it, the large uh, scope are to validate uh, a standard methodology for the determination of the number of layers of the few graphene uh, flakes using Raman spectroscopy to determine the uncertainties uh, associated with the measurement and with uh, the data analysis. 
analysis and to provide input to a future revision of the ISO technical specification 21356-1 structural characterization of, uh, of graphene. And uh, in particular, uh, we, we will characterize nanoplatelets deposited on silicon dioxide silicon substrates, and we will investigate in the study two types of samples. The one based on electrochemically exfoliated sample flakes obtained by a commercially available powder that contains few layer graphene, and uh, this part of the work has the aim to test uh, the method of looking at real com commercial flake. And uh, the other type of sample uh, are constituted by me mechanically exfoliated uh, flakes uh, obtained by the exfoliation of high order pyrolytic graphite. And this uh, part of the study will, be will focus on uh, determining differences in the number of layers on, uh, the, graphene, uh, on the graphene flakes. The study is organized as follows. Each participant will receive uh, two samples. Uh, the samples are produced in collaboration uh, among LNE, NPL, and the University of Manchester. And uh, the sample will be uh, preliminary characterized at INRIM, both by Raman and atomic force microscopy. Then uh, the participant, uh, when they will get the samples, We'll have to take uh, uh, the do, do the measure the Raman measurement and also to perform the data analysis. The raw data will be also analyzed. Uh, all the raw data will be also analyzed uh, at Ethereum that will will compare all the results from all the participants and also will uh, uh, draft the report about the results of uh, of the study. Uh, here, I will give some details about the, the, uh, about the materials that will be provided to the participant and the requirements that the uh, Raman apparatus of the participant needs to satisfy. First of all, the sample that will be supplied in this uh, study are not certified reference materials but have been selected uh, as the best available type for these studies. To each participant will be provided the two samples with the mechanically exfoliated flakes and electrochemically exfoliated flakes, plus a polystyrene comparison sample for the spectra, uh, spectral calibration of the Raman spectrometer, and uh, also a flake localization reference accompanying the sheet will be provided for the participants to be able to find the flake of interest on the substrate. Uh, this is uh, how the electrochemical, uh, no, the mechanically exfoliated samples looks uh, like. As you can see, there is a grating. No, maybe in the next slide you will see better. In any case, in, in the data sheet uh, uh, within that will come along with the protocol, you will find the coordinates uh, and all the information for localizing the flakes. Uh, because they are were deposited the electrochemically exfoliated the flakes on a patterned substrate, while in the case of uh, electrochemical mechanical exfoliated flakes, the substrate is uh, not patterned. But in any case, uh, with uh, our instruction, we, you will be able to find the, the flake. As you can see uh, in this optical image, uh, there is a very nice contrast. So you can easily observe the markers that uh, are etched on the substrate. You can see also the nice isogiscope logo. And below the logo, you can find the grating for the calibration of the instrument uh, that have a pitch of 900 nanometers and the step eight of, six, uh, uh, of 60 nanometers. Uh, about the requirements of your Raman apparatus, uh, it has to work in a backset catering configuration and capable, capable of measuring Raman shift in the range of interest. It uh, needed to be uh, equipped with the stage with, the, with mapping capabilities with a step size not uh, exceeding 0.2 micro, uh, micrometers. Uh, the measurement is to uh, have to be carried out with a, pre, a 532 nanometer laser. 
And by using a dry microscope objective lens with a magnification of uh, 100 times with a numeri numerical aperture of uh, at least 0.75. Uh, also, the instruments need to be calibrated in wavelength using a rare gas lamp. Uh, you can follow the standard guide for testing the resolution of the Raman spectrometer for the calibration. Also, uh, the instruments need a uh, calibration in relative intensity by using, uh, for example, the NEET uh, standard reference material Artibus. And also, uh, we need uh, to have uh, the calibration of the, of the stage in uh, space. And also, all the details uh, in the specific of your, or your means of calibration uh, need to be specified in, your, uh, in the measurement report. This is uh, uh, other requirements, uh, we need uh, to use uh, an excitation laser power lower or equal to one milliwatt. This is uh, the type of map uh, that we are expecting and the type of spectrum that uh, we need, which can be considered a good uh, output of the Raman measurement. And you have to optimize your Raman parameter by focusing on a different flakes uh, in respect of the one that you will use, uh, that we have identified for the comparison. And uh, the optimization is reached when uh, we will get uh, you or the participant will get a background signal uh, to, uh, to noise ratio of at least 20 for the G peak. Uh, of course, you, we have to optimize, you have uh, all the participants have to optimize uh, the parameters for also for the mechanically exfoliated uh, samples. And uh, uh, each participant needs to provide uh, three sets of measurement. Uh, first of all, a Raman spectrum of the polystyrene sample for the spectral calibration of the spectrometer, five Raman maps uh, of the target flakes uh, on the electrochemically exfoliated sample, and then one or more Raman maps uh, on the mechanically exfoliated samples, and it depends on the characteristic of the flake uh, of the, on the wafer. And uh, of course, uh, on the data set and on the report, you have to specify all the info of the measurement. I don't go into the details, but uh, you have to define instruments and model of the, the model of the instruments and uh, the parameters that you use for the, the measurement and also the details about uh, the data analysis. This is for uh, uh, closing the presentation, the timetable. Uh, in particular, we are uh, collecting the participant at this stage, and then we are planning to send out the sample for measurement to the participant around the uh, mid of October. And uh, the participants are required to send back the results of their measurement within uh, three months. And uh, due to some uh, constraint, we won't be able to consider results that will be received later than uh, three months. So we think to close the comparison in uh, January uh, or at least at the beginning of uh, February. This is uh, the poster that has been published on the BAMAS website. And uh, I thank you for your attention and I hope that you are interested in the study and you will be able to join it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Chiara. And thank you very much to all our speakers for a very, very exciting and interesting um, sessions. I hope everyone has learned uh, a lot about Raman spectroscopy. Um, I'm going to, at this stage, hand back over to Terence to lead the question and answers session, Terence. All right, well, thank you, Charles. And, um, and thank you as well to, to all of the, the speakers and the presentations. Um, this has been very, very comprehensive, both on the technical side, but also um, on a practical side to look at the projects that are ongoing with the G-Scope and the interlab testing, um, which is critical to take this work forward. Um, so th there are quite a few questions. I know that we, we've we kind of uh, gone to the 90 minute um, level here, but um, what, one of the questions was regarding the doping and why that uh, causes a shift in the, in the Raman spectra. And if you can tell the difference between uh, P-doping and N-doping, that was one question. There and there was a second one, and uh, I believe it's related, but I'm not the technical person here. 
is on also with a material that's been functionalized and, and that causes a shift. So can we just talk about the, the doping and functionalization of material and how that affects the shift? Um, yeah, so I mean, as you as you dope, you're effectively um, changing the, the strength of those of those bonds. So as you do that, as you introduce or remove um, electrons from those bonds, the strength of those bonds and therefore their vibrational uh, frequency, the resonant frequency of that vibration um, changes. Um, um, but because of the microscopic origin of those peaks, the the rate of, of shift changes. It's different between the, the different peaks, which is why you can then separate the, the strain from the, the doping effect. Um, I think there was a follow up about whether you can separate P and an N doping. Um, my memory of that work is that the P and N doping both shift peaks in the same direction. Um, strain, tension and, and compression move the peaks in opposite directions. But I, my memory is that the the P and N doping both shift the peaks in the same direction. Um, I'm not sure whether Erlon and, or Matthew have um, anything to, to add to that. So if, if there are no um, additional comments to that, um, th there are a bunch of questions here. So I'll try to pick out something that's, that's uh, relevant. Um, one of the questions is uh, regarding if there's a standard method to characterize CVD graphene on copper substrate and um, I'd like to expand that question then to just talk about the importance of the substrate. I know it was covered um, is, is to be able to uh, differentiate or, or uh, correct for that background uh, scattering, depending on the substrate that's used, if I understood this correctly. So can we just talk about um, a lot of CVD graphene is produced on copper. So that's a very specific question that would have high relevance. It's used frequently but just the importance of correcting for the substrate or the background um, scattering. So I'll quickly mention, um, Terrence, we're actually working on a um, on copper um, measurement development. Um, it certainly is nowhere near ready to submit for standardization. Um, so, I mean, the, the shorter answer is no, there is no standard presently for graphene as grown on copper. However, work is going on to sort of build that library of knowledge to then move forward to the interlab study, and then that would go on to a documentary standard. Thank you. Does anybody else want to contribute to that or talk about the importance of the substrate and how to manage it? it it's certainly important. And at the moment, we basically need to transfer to to, to silicon dioxide. Thank you. Um, this is a master class on ramen, uh, but there is a question about comparing this with XRD. And of course, ramen is not usually used in isolation when characterizing graphene. It's one of the tools. Um, XRD is an interesting one that is quite often used. Um, does anybody want to talk about very briefly, how does XRD compare and contrast with ramen and how they could be used complementary? To I, I can touch on that briefly. We did discuss this a lot in the, the ISO committee as to whether to include XRD, particularly in the, in the structural characterization document. Um, at the end of the discussion, it was, it was really decided that because we use Raman spectroscopy as a sort of quick check, as a first quick check in the standard to see whether we have any graphene or graphite present in, a, in our sample. Um, so it, as, as we do that quick check with Raman, it sort of made sense to stick with Raman spectroscopy for, for the second stage for the more detailed analysis um, rather than involving another technique such as X-ray diffraction, XRD, um, and perhaps uh, Raman is slightly more widely available compared with XRD, but um, uh, I, I don't know on that, but that, that, that is the reason why 
we, we focus at the moment on Raman spectroscopy rather than X-ray diffraction. Understood. Thank you. I, I think because of the time that we've gone through and the uh, thoroughness of the presentation you have, I think we can conclude the Q&A at this point, if, if that's okay with everybody. So I want to thank everyone who's participated, the time and the, um, the expertise that's been shared by our uh, subject matter experts is truly appreciated. The Graphene Council is a neutral global professional and trade association. So whether you're in academia or you're in the commercial sector, we are a platform to help connect, educate, inform, and advocate on behalf of graphene and other 2D materials that are gonna change our world and are changing our world. So on, on behalf of the Graphene Council, thank you to everyone for those who contributed. Thank you for those who participated and watched. And um, stay safe and stay tuned for more information and from the Graphene Council. Terrence, Terrence, both Charles and I want to do a big shout out to you and the Graphene Council. This opportunity is really wonderful, and we appreciate um, you bringing it to your community. Um, so we, we really appreciate that. And the work that the Graphene Council is doing in helping develop standards. Um, so thank you. Oh, that's, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Well, thank you all again. We really appreciate um, the chance to do this together. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Um, take care, everyone, and, and uh, we'll stay in touch. Thank you.